Boa tarde a todos, bem-vindo novamente aqui ao nosso simpósio Parkinson Pesquisa e Cuidado, né, vamos agora ao nosso segundo turno de excelentes palestras, de excelentes conversas aqui para nós desvendarmos e aprendermos um pouco mais sobre essa doença e é um imenso prazer apresentar para vocês aqui, né, o nosso querido professor Inácio Fernandes Mata, né, que vai ministrar a palestra Uh, Genetics of Parkinson's Disease in Latin America. Já uh, o professor Inácio, ele é biólogo, geneticista, e trabalha já há 15 anos com pesquisa sobre fatores genéticos relacionados à doença de Parkinson. Ele realizou seus estudos de pós-doutorado na Universidade de Washington, no laboratório La Zabetia, e está envolvido em diversos projetos internacionais de grande porte para a identificação de fatores genéticos da doença de Parkinson. Ele é coordenador do Consórcio Latino-Americano de Genética para a Doença de Parkinson e trabalha atualmente no Genomic Medicine Institute do campus do Centro Médico Acadêmico Americano Cleveland, é, Cleveland Clinic Main Campus, em Cleveland, Ohio. Então, é um prazer muito grande recebê-lo. Peço que o doutor Bruno também faça uma breve introdução, que é colega direto do doutor Inácio, né, e sobre a palestra que ele vai proferir para a gente, a gente passa a palavra para ele. Gente, muito rápido. É, professor Inácio, uma das melhores pessoas que eu já conheci no, no mundo da ciência. Fantástico, me recebeu por três meses lá em Washington, quando eu morava lá. Foi meu, foi da minha banca de doutorado, e desde então a gente tem nessa, trabalhado nessa parceria e nessa tentativa de inserir Belém no contexto da, do estudo das doenças genéticas do de vista mundial, e as coisas estão indo bem, graças a Deus. Então, é uma honra ter o Inácio aqui com a gente para falar um pouco sobre genética nesse parque, sabe muito. Nacho, please. Thank, thank you guys so much. Let me see if I can share my screen here. Uh... Can you guys see it there? Sure, sure, it's perfectly visible. Perfect. Yeah, so th thank you so much for the invitation. Uh, <clears throat> it's always a, a pleasure to to talk to uh, our our colleagues and as Bruno said he he has spent some time with us and we're really fond of him and uh, all our colleagues in Brazil so I'm always happy to to share all the things that we're doing with them uh, so in my talk I want to I know I only have 30 minutes uh, I'm going to go a little bit quick uh, but I wanted to cover some some uh, uh, topics I, I don't think I need to tell you guys about Parkinson's disease so I'll just mention one uh, quick slide about that and then I'll, I'll do a quick review of what we know about the genetics of Parkinson's disease uh, currently and then why it's necessary to do studies not only in Latin America really but in all non-European populations and then I'll explain a little bit about the project that uh, uh, Bruno and uh, other colleagues in Brazil are part of which is the uh, large PD consortia and then uh, some of the results that we've had and some of the places where we want to uh, uh, go uh, moving forward. Uh, so uh, again, I, I won't mention much about Parkinson's disease. I just wanted to show this slide to show that it's, it's, it's the second most common uh, neurogenic disorder after Alzheimer's, but it's, it's growing faster than Alzheimer's. Uh, I, rec I highly recommend reading this paper by uh, Ray Dorsey, uh, where he shows that he thinks by 2040 it will surpass uh, Alzheimer's disease and I also wanted to highlight the fact that it's a, a disease that affects all populations although it seems to be uh, the prevalence seems to be different in some parts of the world although again that could be biased by uh, diagnosis and access to uh, uh, movement disorder specialists in some uh, uh, places and Although we've known about the disease for about 200 years, uh, we still don't really understand very well wh why, why, why it happens. We know that there are certain risk factors, uh, being age, probably the most important one, the, mo the older we get, the higher it is, the likelihood that we're going to develop Parkinson's and also other neurological disorders, and also gender. So. Um, uh, uh, contrary to what happens in Alzheimer's here, uh, men have about two to one 
uh, uh, ratio compared to females. So it's more common in males than females. And then there's uh, certain environmental exposures like uh, heavy metals and pesticides, uh, which might be very important for in countries like Brazil, for example, uh, seem to also be uh, uh, playing a role on developing the, the disease. And lately there's been a lot of conversation about uh, inflammation, head trauma, the microbiome, but again, I won't be able to talk to, uh, uh, to you about this uh, today. And then there's also some protective factors, the smoking being probably the most uh, uh, well known uh, together with caffeine and exercise it might not be as protective as it could be to help slow the disease, especially the motor symptoms and uh, also uh, um, taking anti-inflammatories seem to be a, a protective uh, factor. But today I want to talk about to you uh, genetics and also... Uh yeah. Nice. Uh, and natural. Excuse me, please. Uh, could you please unshare and reshare your screen because your slides are not passing. We are seeing just the first one. Oh, so. No. Uh, okay. Hold on. Yes. Okay. Please try try to unshare and share it again. Maybe after passing the first slide. Okay. Let me see. Sometimes this happens on meet. Okay. Let's see. Let's try again. Okay, try to... Can you see the move? Uh, no, no, we are still on the first slide. Uh-oh, hold on. Let me, let me try something different. Uh, I'm sorry about this. Uh, let's see if I do it this way. Okay, try to pass. Uh, okay, great. Now it's working. They're moving? Okay, okay. Yeah, good. now they are moving perfectly fine. Thank you. I'm, I'm sorry, sorry about for that. The so, no, 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 please. <laughs> so th this is the figure that I show. So again, it's it, it's highly, you know, it's fast increasing the number of uh, uh, individuals with Parkinson's. And again, it's uh, all over the world. And then I mentioned some of the risk factors. And, and again, uh, my uh, uh, topic today is really talking about genetics and how uh, ancestry or ethnicity might, might be playing a, a role on, on the genetics. And just to give you a summary, so we know that Parkinson's disease is really not a genetic disease like, you know, Huntington's or some other uh, uh, genetic diseases, but um, about 20 to 25 percent of the uh, people with Parkinson's will report that they have another family member affected, which usually points out to at least having a, a, a a genetic component of, of the risk for the for the disease uh, and studying these families have has allowed us to identify uh, close to 25 different genes that are playing a role where mutations uh, you know can either increase uh, very much or be a hundred percent causative of the of the disease uh, and I'll talk ab about a couple of them uh, uh, today uh, but the majority of the cases are sporadic, uh, and to, to be able to identify genetic risk factors in these sporadic um, uh, cases, what we do is we compare the frequency of variance between cases and controls in a studies that we call genome-wide association studies, or GWAS. Uh, and there's been several GWAS in Parkinson's disease. This is the latest one published in 2019. Uh, it's the largest by far. It has almost 40,000 uh, patients and about 1.4 million controls, healthy controls. And this study allowed uh, uh, the researchers to identify 90 variants in 78 different uh, loci or close to uh, genes uh, that explains about 16% of the heritability risk for Parkinson's disease. Uh, and I want to point out that all these studies, step one uh, or two, have been done only in European uh, individuals. And this means that they have at least more than 97% of their uh, uh, genome is uh, from uh, European ancestry. And, you know, uh, learning about all these genetic uh, uh, variants and all these genes that are uh, influencing the risk for Parkinson's disease is now allowing us to build models where we can predict um, quite uh, well who uh, who is a high risk or low risk to develop Parkinson's disease. This is a study that was done with the results from this uh, study. And uh, comparing about 1,800 variants, we can see that if we if we divide our cohort at tertiles, uh, the, the first tertiles so or the lower risk compared to the higher risk, there's a difference of about six-fold. Uh, so there is certainly an increased risk uh, on those individuals that have a larger number of uh, uh, some of these risk variants. And this is just a summary of 
of the genetics of Parkinson's disease where we can't really forget about the environmental factors. And then we have here the familial genes that I talked to about, and these are the GWAS genes that are usually more common in the population, but the effect of each of them is uh, uh, very little. But when you combine several of these, and then together usually with environmental factors can be the cause for Parkinson's disease. So why do we need studies in other populations? Well, I just, give you, I just gave you a hint. Uh, and is that uh, individuals that are non-European are very uh, uh, bad represented in genetic studies. And this study really shows how bad uh, we're doing at being diverse uh, or including other populations in gen genetic studies. This paper that was published in 2016 showed that in 2009, more than 96% of all individuals that were included in genetic uh, studies were of European ancestry. Although, and although we improve a lot in the in the the uh, other seven uh, years after 2016, where it now is only 81%, which is still very overrepresented. Uh, but we see that the gain is mostly because of the studies in Asia, mostly in Japan and China. But there are populations that are uh, uh, very large uh, in the world. Uh, including Africans uh, that are less than 3% or Hispanic Latinos, which are is less than 0.5%, the individuals that are included in genetic studies. And th this makes the, there's a lack of understanding of how genetics play a role in disease, uh, not only in Parkinson's, but uh, in, in these populations. And in Parkinson's, uh, we're doing a, a poor job as well. These are two very large studies here in the U.S., where you know Hispanics are about uh, 10 to 15 percent of the population, and you can see here uh, that individuals of non-European, so this includes Hispanics and African Americans, which together probably do about 20 percent, are only represented about four percent in one and six percent on the other. So we're doing again a very bad job capturing and recruiting these individuals to participate in genetic studies. And something that is a there's a high risk is that this polygenic risk scores this. Uh, um, uh, summary uh, or addition of all the common variants uh, to try to determine high risk versus low risk. When you use uh, data only coming from European populations, uh, we see that data it doesn't work well to uh, be able to predict uh, risk in other populations, especially in those that have high African uh, ancestry. Uh, but even in Amerindian or, or Latinos, uh, you know, there's a drop between 100% to close to uh, 60%. So there's a huge drop uh, uh, in, in understanding. So we need more studies so we can build these uh, uh, models, uh, taking into consideration variants that are from uh, uh, these diverse populations. So because of this, uh, we started this project in Latin America. It started really in 2006, so a long, long time ago with two sites, one in Brazil and one in Uruguay. Um, and uh, this this is now uh, the largest uh, study of Parkinson's disease uh, in uh, in Latin America in the world. So you can see here we have close to 36 centers in 12 different countries. Um, we we just um, uh, created or or our colleagues in Brazil just created a, a, a the Brazilian consortia without within a large PD because we have many many centers that uh, want to participate. Some of our colleagues are represented here, um, but this is allowing us to to really take the research to a next level and be able to do some of the things that we thought you know we we wouldn't be able to do because of the numbers. So. Uh, currently, we have almost uh, 4,000 individuals uh, recruited, um, uh, both uh, healthy controls and also Parkinson's patients, about half and half. And uh, we just got a grant about a year and a half ago from the Michael J. Fox Foundation to recruit about 5,000 more. Uh, our goal is to, in two years, to have close to 9,000 individuals that will allow us to do uh, very good genetic studies. And because, uh, as I mentioned, environment is very important. We have a whole questionnaire that we're also using uh, where we collect more clinical data and also environmental data that we will be able to use also to understand the role of the environment in these uh, communities and also the interaction between the genetics and the environment, which is really what will help us explain the majority of the of the risk for Parkinson's disease. Um, so what have we done so far? So, you know, we, we started really uh, trying to understand the low hanging fruit. So those variants in those genes that are really well known, like LER2, the variant G2019S, 
uh, things that are very common around the world. We wanted to see how it affected uh, our patients in Latin America. Uh, so G2 and antines is the most common uh, genetic mutation in Parkinson's disease. Uh, um, you can see that there's almost uh, carriers for this mutation in almost every single country in the world where it has been studied, uh, except Korea and Taiwan. Uh, most of the countries, uh, they have somebody that have this, this mutation and the risk can be, or, or the frequency can be as low as 0.1% in, in India or 0.2% now we have in Peru. Uh, this is not uh, updated. And then uh, it can go as high as 15% uh, in Ashkenazi Jews or 50% almost in North Africa. So the Berbers, uh, one in every two patients with Parkinson's disease has uh, this mutation. So uh, we uh, did some of the first uh, genetic studies uh, to, to try to determine the frequency. And we saw that the frequency in Latin America is very different between countries. So a few years ago, we did a, a, an analysis comparing the the amount of uh, or the frequency of these mutations, both the G2 and TNS, but also mutations in the whole gene. And we saw that there was a really good correlation between how much European ancestry was in every every country uh, compared to the frequency. And you can see here with G2 and TNS is 0.84%, uh, 0.84 the, the correlation. And uh, we, we when we consider all the mutations, uh, it's actually statistically significant. So that means that the more European uh, ancestry a person has uh, or a country has in general, uh, the more uh, likely it is that we're going to find these mutations. Uh, and this matches really well with the studies that we had done previously, where we showed that most of these uh, uh, G2019 carriers come from actually one single um, ancestor that was supposed to live about 250 years uh, BC, uh, somewhere in the Middle East, and from there it got spread all across the, the world, and we we can imagine that probably uh, all the conquistadors from Europe uh, brought this mutation to uh, uh, Latin America. Another very interesting study was to study GBA. So GBA is really not a causal gene, but it's a, a very uh, potent uh, uh, risk gene. And what I mean by this is that uh, this is uh, comparable to ApoE4 in Alzheimer's. So it's a gene where variants are rather common in the normal population. And although they're not uh, necessary uh, to cause disease or they cause disease all the time, uh, they certainly increase the risk between five to 10 times more uh, if you carry a mutation in this gene. So we studied uh, two of our cohorts that have uh, uh, the lowest uh, European ancestry, the Peruvians and the and the Colombians, and we saw that uh, the frequency in Peru is very similar to what uh, we see in other parts of the world. About five percent of the patients have a mutations in this in this gene. The mutation distribution is very different. Uh, you can see here, uh, but we're not going to go into the detail. But I think the most interesting part was that in Colombia, we saw the frequency was actually double compared to all the other uh, countries. And uh, this is due mostly to a mutation that is population specific. It has only been seen uh, in Colombian patients. Uh, and this doubles the number of uh, carriers, which makes it really uh, interesting population to study, especially because um, uh, so GBA is the gene that causes Gaucher disease, which is a, a metabolism, a lipid metabolism disorder. Uh, and we know that there are already drugs approved to treat Gaucher. Uh, so we think that some of those drugs could be important to treat uh, some of the uh, Parkinson's disease symptoms. So, uh, so we think that this cohort, for example, in Colombia could be very interested to do clinical uh, trials. And we saw that the risk is about four to six fold, which is what uh, we see in other populations, so the risk is very similar. And we also see an earlier age of onset for patients that have uh, uh, these mutations in this gene, which is, again, something that we see in other, in other populations. But having this really large number of individuals is allowing us to do things like, a, like a, the first GWAS uh, in Parkinson's disease in Latino uh, cohorts. Um, one of the barriers that we had to uh, um, pass was the fact that uh, until a few years ago, there were no any genotyping uh, platforms that we could use that had a good representation of genetic variants from non-European ancestry. Uh, Illumina finally created this multi-ethnic global B chip uh, that is is done uh, to study populations that uh, you know that they are ethnic, so they have some uh, European population, but they also have Amerindian, African, and other uh, um, uh, populations. 
Uh, in, in our study, we use 1,500 individuals and we genotype uh, 1.8 million variants. Uh, and after QC, we ended up with about 1,500 individuals and about 1.3 million variants that we uh, were able to study. And this allow us to, uh, uh, to actually see the synuclein, which is the top gene in every single GWAS for all the populations, is also uh, very highly significant associated with risk in, uh, in our cohort in Latin America. And we also nominated a new gene in chromosome 3. Uh, that has not been identified until now that we think might be associated to Amerindian ancestry because it's very frequent in our Peruvian uh, 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 cohort. Um, and within synuclein, we also saw that the genes, some of the genes are common between Europeans and, and Latinos, but some of the variants are also different. Um, Unfortunately, there's not a lot of cohorts that we could use to validate our results. So we uh, we talked to 23andMe and they uh, did a replication study with about 1,200 uh, uh, Latino uh, Parkinson's patients and about 400,000 healthy controls. And they were able to replicate our results in synuclein. However, they didn't see this NROS, uh, this new uh, uh, potential gene. Uh, and the reason why is because what we think that it could be due to the fact that their Hispanic Latinos are, uh, they have a much lower uh, ancestry from Amerindian uh, uh, chromosomes than the, the people from our cohort, where especially Peruvians have uh, close to 75% of uh, Amerindian ancestry. We also looked at all the variants that were associated with uh, uh, risk in Europeans in our cohort. And although we don't have power to detect the, the association, we see that in most cases, more than 80% of them uh, go in the same direction. So the, the effect is in the same direction, which suggests that there's probably a substantial overlap in PD genetic architecture between the two populations. Um, uh, but again, we need larger numbers to be able to confirm uh, a lot of these hits. And, and something that I'm sure you guys are aware of is that, you know, Latinos, although here in the U.S., we like to put them all in one bag, uh, you know, you're very different. Even within Brazil, which is a huge country with incredible uh, genetic diversity, uh, individuals can be, you know, almost 100 percent European, almost 100 percent African, almost 100 percent indigenous and anything in between. Um, so with the genetic data, we could actually classify very well in this uh, graph called PCA or principal uh, component analysis. We can see the admixture uh, that exists in our cohort between countries and also within countries. Uh, here is uh, our uh, uh, cohort from Africa. This is a cohort from Europe. This is a cohort from uh, indigenous populations. And then you can see here in pink our Peruvians, which are very close to the Amerindians. Our Colombians are kind of here in the middle. And then in blue, you can see all the Brazilians which are kind of close to the Europeans, but you know, going towards the, the African, uh, because there's a big African component, as you know, in some countries in, or in some parts of Brazil. And also we have some individuals here that are quite close to the Amerindians as well. So, so again, in Brazil, you have really a huge diversity. And this, is, this makes some of the analysis really hard, but it also allows us to do something that is really cool and innovative, that it hasn't been done uh, a match, especially in Parkinson's disease, which is, uh, using this local ancestry or or basically haplotypes, so parts of the genome that comes from different uh, ancestries, and we can uh, split those so we can identify what parts of your genome comes from what population, and then we can cut those uh, with using bioinformatic tools and then look for a specific variants that are either African or are Amerindian that might be associated to um, to disease risk. And by doing this, we were able to identify four new uh, uh, genetic uh, regions, uh, three of them uh, highly linked to the Amerindian ancestry and one linked to the African ancestry that might be playing a role and might be uh, population specific uh, uh, to, to individuals that have this ancestry. So again, this is something that we need to replicate, but all these four are new regions that do not overlap with any of the uh, 90 variants that were identified in European. So this is very uh, exciting. And this is part of a, a paper that we have right now in review and uh, analysis of neurology. And we hope that it's going to be uh, uh, published very soon. And having this data also allow us to look at this polygenic risk score. So try to predict who is parking, who has Parkinson's and who uh, doesn't uh, using all this genetic data. And we saw surprisingly uh, opposite of what we thought it was going to happen, that the polygenic risk score, these this models actually work better in large PD, uh, especially in Peruvians. And 
The reason why is because there is one SNP and there's one single variant in synuclein that explains about 73% of this um, of this risk. Uh, and it, it just happens that in populations that have high Amerindian or Asian uh, ancestry, the frequency of this variant is much higher. So it means that this SNP is playing a huge role on, on risk uh, for Parkinson's in these populations. And another really interesting thing that we saw is that uh, not only is more frequent, but it's also on a different haplotype. So it's surrounded by uh, different variants. Uh, so this is SNP in synuclein is surrounded by different variants, and we don't know as yet what the effect uh, might be on this, but we think that it, it might be playing a role on this variant having a bigger effect than the same variant uh, when it's in a haplotype uh, coming from a European ancestry. So this is, uh, again, new new data that we're hoping to, to publish very soon uh, to, to, to put some uh, new hypotheses out there for people to uh, uh, test uh, functionally. Uh, and uh, one study that we published last year in movement disorders uh, allow us to identify or to yeah to to use this genetic data to identify copy number variants. This is when there's a uh, either a duplication or a deletion of uh, parts of the gene, and this is something that is very common in synuclein, for example, where families sometimes have duplication or you know, triplication of the whole gene. Um, but also in parkin, a recessive gene uh, that causes early onset Parkinson's disease, and. Uh, by studying this in our patients, we saw that uh, we were able to identify 22 individuals that have uh, copy number variants either in parking or synuclein, and we saw a nice correlation with age, so uh, with age of onset. So, uh, you know, people that have uh, copy number variants have an earlier age of onset, and also is, a, is also associated with a high uh, increase, even if you only have a copy, for example, in parking. Uh, however, we we uh, didn't see any effect in uh, with copy number variants in any other gene in the genome because we were able to uh, test the whole genome and we didn't see anything in the in the rest of the genome. And uh, you know we don't want to forget about the families. And as I mentioned before, about twenty percent of the Parkinson's patients have a family history of the disease. Uh, there are some genes, but all of the genes have been identified mostly in European. Uh, uh, individuals. So we wanted to see how those genes explain family uh, uh, cases in Latin America. So we did a we did a panel where we include about uh, 29 uh, different Parkinson's genes, and then we also added some genes from dementia. And we ran it through families where there was at least two affected individuals. Uh, a lot of them have four, five, six, so really large families like this Brazilian family I'm presenting here uh, uh, from uh, Dr. Tumas. In, in Riverau, and uh, and we saw that uh, about only one third of the families had a mutation in a known gene. So there are a lot of families in Latin America that cannot be explained by mutations in all the known genes, which really suggests to us that there might be other genes that we are not, we haven't identified, we're not considering. And then about half of the mutations that we found in known genes were actually new mutations that had not been identified uh, previously, like this one. In the F box gene in the in the Brazilian uh, uh, family, so this is obviously very interesting uh, uh, results. We're now this this was done with uh, money from the Parkinson's Foundation, and now uh, with another grant from the American Parkinson's Disease Association, we're expanding this to about 300 more individuals from families all across the the. Uh, Latin America, and we're seeing something very similar where there's a lot of families that are not explained, and most of the families that are not explained come from uh, populations like Peru, Honduras, for example, where the European ancestry is the lowest. Uh, so again, there is a huge uh, uh, things that we we can uh, uh, find, new, new findings that we can uh, gather by studying these uh, understudied populations. Uh, so I think we, you know, in Latin America, we have a really good opportunity to be able to identify um, uh, new genes and also try to understand better how uh, the known genes affect these uh, individuals in our communities. Uh, so in summary, for this part of the, of the talk, uh, I just wanted to show the importance of synuclein in PD risk in, in Latinos, especially this uh, one variant uh, that seems to be a contributor. Uh, we are also nominated several uh, specific new loci using our, our GWAS. Um, we also shown for the first time increased burden of copy number variant in PD genes in Latinos. 
Uh, we've identified novel pathogenic variants in known PD genes, and also more importantly, which now we're working on these families, uh, we've identified many families where uh, there is not a mutation in any of the known genes, opening the avenue for identifying new genes that could be more common in, uh, in, uh, in countries from Latin America. So just to finish up, I just wanted to say, what are we doing now to move things forward and to make this better and, and do better studies? Uh, so we were lucky to get, uh, as I mentioned, funded by the Michael J. Fox Foundation to recruit more individuals. And this is part of a larger worldwide project to um, increase the diversity of, uh, of genetic studies in Parkinson's, including individuals in Asia and Southeast populations, uh, very large populations that have been uh, uh, very underrepresented in genetic studies. Uh, in addition, uh, we also have a, a grant from the National Institute of Health from the NIH that is going to allow us to genotype the, the new samples that we're going to recruit, the new patients that we're going to recruit about, as I mentioned, about 5,000 uh, more in the next two years. Uh, we're going to be working on, um, on the families. We're going to do whole genome sequencing in some of the families that were negative for the panel to be able to identify new genes. And we're also going to work in a better polygenic risk score uh, that will use all the variants that we're identifying that are specific to Latinos to improve that uh, uh, those models to be able to uh, predict better who who is a high risk for the disease in our uh, uh, communities. And this is part of a, uh, this global Parkinson's genetic program is a worldwide program where. Uh, our goal is to genotype 150,000 uh, individuals all across the, the world. Uh, and I, I put here some of the uh, papers and the, the websites where you can find more information. And I'm leading the underrepresented populations working group uh, together with uh, uh, Artur uh, from Porto Alegre, uh, trying to put together uh, all the researchers from all these different regions of the world to work together towards the same uh, common goal. Um, and as part of this project, I just wanted to mention to this group, since I know that there's a lot of students uh, listening to us, we've gen we're generating lots of training uh, uh, modules as part of this project that are all free. Uh, uh, so I, I highly recommend to go to this, G to this GP2 uh, website, and I'm be more than happy to provide all these links. Uh, so you can do, uh, you can learn a lot about genetics and uh, bioinformatics by uh, doing these free uh, courses. Uh, they all have videos uh, that are very instructive and they also have exercises that you can do. And we're also providing funding uh, that are specific for our region. Uh, so for right, right now we have an active uh, grant um, that closes on April 30th. So probably uh, any of you probably won't have time to fill it up, but there's a lot more coming, uh, which is a PhD program uh, to for students to do in Latin America that is fully funded by by GP2, and we also have a grant promoting diversity, equity, and inclusion in Parkinson's disease. And I know a lot of our colleagues in Brazil have applied for this to try to get some money to do uh, local projects, uh, including pesticides and other projects. So uh, again, is if you're interested in research, this is a really good way to find more information to try to get some funding for your for your projects. Um, and we also like to train people. Uh, Bruno said that he was with us and we've received people from Argentina, Peru, Uruguay, from all these different places. And we also do, uh, before COVID obviously, we used to do a lot of training locally. So we will go to the country and we do a workshop for several days to teach bioinformatics and anything that uh, is related to uh, uh, genetics. And just to finish up, I wanted to do a plug for the uh, Parkinson, the World Parkinson's Congress. I don't know if you guys know about this Congress, but it's it's an incredible opportunity because there's not only researchers and clinicians, but also patients and caregivers attend this, this meeting. Uh, it'll be hopefully in 2022 in Barcelona. So I highly recommend uh, uh, applying. Uh, there's going to be grants to travel there. Uh, the abstract submission will open this summer. Uh, so be, be aware of that. And there's actually, as part of this meeting, there's a virtual meeting happening uh, next month. Uh, I think it only costs like $25 to register and it's uh, 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 three days uh, with lots of talks from the experts around the world. So I highly recommend uh, checking this out. So with that, I just wanted to thank everybody, all the patients. If you guys have any questions that I cannot answer today, this is my email. Uh, so please feel free to email me with any questions or concerns that you might have. 
And uh, again, I want to thank you for inviting me, and I want to thank all, especially all our Brazilian colleagues, because they've been uh, instrumental to be able to develop this this project. And I'm very, very happy to to be collaborating with such a great group of uh, people. So thank you. Okay, thank you very much, Inacio. And uh, Bruno, just a quick uh, uh, quick thing. Our team is asking for you to turn on the camera. They want to take a picture for us to post in the website of the of the uh, event. Okay. okay. Uh, Juliana, uh, you can do it. <laughs> okay, everybody smile. <laughs> Perfect picture. Já está no jeito, pode tirar. Ok, e uh, so, uh, question, do we have five minutes? Do, would you like, Bruno, some? I have one. <laughs> Por favor, pode começar. Ok, uh, thank you, Dr. Inácio, very much. It was really good uh, amount of data that you did show us. It's very interesting. And uh, it brings us again to that point that it seems that Brazil, it's again a big lab, you know, uh, because if we compare uh, our miscegenation process, it's more diversified when we compare it to the rest of Latin America uh, due to the whole historical process that we've been through. And, uh, but it, it, it brings us to one other point, like uh, uh, it's really good to be uh, studying and know that there are some genetic mutations that make you more or less prone to develop Parkinson's. And, uh, uh, what is the next step, for example? Uh, is there some envisioning of some genetic therapies? And uh, what is the next development after identifying what are the main uh, variants and the risks? What's, uh, what's the future uh, of this research? Yeah, uh, yeah. first, yes, yes mentioned that uh, Brazil not only have the genetic diversity, but it also has one of the oldest populations. So you guys live very long. Uh, which is also uh, very good uh, in terms of uh, uh, being able to study neurological disorders. And then you have the pesticides. So really in Brazil, you have all the, all the things that we know that uh, uh, are uh, affecting Parkinson's. So I think it's a great place to, to study it. Um, in respect to your, to your question, as I mentioned, there's a lot of genes involved in Parkinson's disease. So gene therapy, I don't think is something that we can, uh, at least gene therapy as we know as correcting genetic defects I have the feeling that it's going to be very hard. Uh, there is gene therapy being uh, used right now with like BDNF, some neuroprotective uh, 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 substance that can be, uh, 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 you know, injected in the brain and produced that might be protecting the neurons. However, what I really think that this data is going to uh, be used, I think it's going to be used in, in at least two different ways. One is going to be able to identify individuals before they develop the symptoms. And this is very important to do in Parkinson's where there's no biomarkers uh, that we can use to, to identify people. And we know that Parkinson's start, you know, 10, 20, 30 years before we see symptoms. Uh, so to, to be able to stop the disease or at least slow it down, it's critical that we identify those individuals before they come to the clinic with uh, movement symptoms, uh, with motor symptoms. Uh, uh, so I think genetics can certainly help uh, uh, identify those individuals and uh, those that have genetic mutations, obviously they're the easy target, right? So uh, perhaps to develop uh, neuro uh, neuroprotective therapies, I think. And then the second way I can see this being used is that we know that uh, Although the, the end point, the disease what, that we see in the clinic is the same, we know that biologically these patients get there in very different ways uh, because there are so many different genes. This is meaning that although, again, the result is the same, they start very differently. Some people might have uh, problems with the mitochondria and the production of energy in the cells. Some other people might have, again, pesticide and toxicity. Uh, we don't know, but we think that the treatment has to be uh, tailored to the biological cause for the disease. So by being able to identify what kind of Parkinson's somebody has, so I, I, I think in the future we'll say you have LERC2 Parkinson's, so you have Parkinson's, Parkinson's, and then the therapy will be different uh, for each of those patients. Um, and then also we are now learning that each of those causes a different form of Parkinson's disease. So for example, for the GBA mutations, we, saw, we, we know that it's not only 
uh, earlier the age of onset, but we also know that it causes cognitive uh, problems very early on in the disease. Usually uh, these individuals will get demented within five to eight years after diagnosis. Uh, so for as a clinician to have this uh, 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 possibility to understand, okay, I, I see somebody in the clinic for the first time, I, I know how he's gonna progress or she's gonna progress uh, uh, and what kind of symptoms I need to look for, I think is gonna be very helpful as well. Uh, so I, I think that's, uh, in, in the short term, I think that's how genetic data is gonna be used. Um, not, not as much gene therapy, but I, I, I see us as, as, again, identifying those individuals that are high risk factor uh, yeah, to be able to treat them earlier, yeah. Okay, thank you very much. Bruno, mm -hmm. you have some questions? <laughs> yes. E, na, se você não se importar, eu vou falar em português primeiro, que é um pedido, e depois eu vou fazer uma pequena pergunta. É, é. Para os colegas que estiverem trabalhando aqui na região, conhecendo pacientes com doença de Parkinson, ou mesmo os pacientes e cuidadores, se quiserem participar do estudo lá de pedir, que o Inácio comentou, a gente está recrutando pacientes, vocês podem entrar em contato com a equipe da Lani, com a minha equipe, que a gente vai se programar para coletar, fazer a análise que tem que fazer, a avaliação clínica, a coleta de sangue, para poder participar do estudo. A gente está à disposição também para informar como é que o estudo é feito, qual é a dinâmica uh, de envio, e eu estou à disposição para fazer todas essas coisas. Só para informar, até o momento aqui em Belém, a gente já tem cerca de 88 pacientes uh, com doença de Parkinson, coletados e mais alguns 40 controles mais ou menos parte dessa dessa desses dados desses amostras já foram enviados para o Inácio outras estão aqui conosco ainda mas por favor a gente precisa desse esforço porque como o Inácio comentou quanto mais nós soubermos de populações diferentes a gente sabe que a nossa população não é muito estudada então é, vai ser melhor, vai ser melhor para o Brasil, vai ser melhor para o mundo inteiro conhecer um pouco mais essas facetas da doença. O que eu queria perguntar, Inácio, é o seguinte, é, você espera que as amostras genéticas que viram daqui de Belém, elas vão trazer informações muito diferentes, coisas muito próprias dela, ou será muito parecida com o que a gente viu com a população do Peru? Uh, yeah, it's, it's very interesting. Uh, yeah, I don't know, I, you know, I don't know, I'm not a population geneticist, so I, I know that uh, they say that even uh, indigenous populations between countries in uh, um, in Latin America are very different, uh, even m more different than we think they are because they split uh, very early on in, uh, in, uh, in humankind. So uh, we know that they're different. So I am sure that it's gonna bring a lot of new information. Uh, uh, that we don't that we don't have. It'll be very interesting to look at that as well and see how closely related they are to some of the things that we're looking in uh, or seeing in Peru. Uh, but yeah, I think every population comes uh, with um, uh, with uh, you know new data. And one one of the things, uh, and I don't want to get too technical, but if, if you know about linkage disequilibrium, so when two variants come together. Um, you know, it gives it, it gives us a, a region, very wide region, where the gene, the causal gene, could be uh, by including other populations where, because of recombination, those linkage disequilibrium regions are much smaller. Uh, what we can actually do is we can, when combining, so right now we're doing a trans-ethnic meta-analysis, so that means that we're putting all the GYSs together from different populations and put them together because the the linkage disequilibrium is very different between populations we're narrowing down from all the variants for example in synuclein which are the important ones and that can only be done by having these very diverse genetic data from different populations that were uh, 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 you know that went through different evolutions and different natural selections and all these different things that really affect genetics so i have no question that uh, is going to bring a lot of really interesting uh, uh, data and is going to understand not only risk for Parkinson's, but it, it'll probably help a lot to understand risk for other uh, diseases like diabetes, cardiovascular disease, because this genetic data can be used for uh, any any disease. Um, uh, so yeah, so I think it's very important, and I'm I'm very happy that you're uh, helping and the uh, patients want to participate. And one thing that I wanted to mention is that uh, you know we're working with a company to be able to uh, generate reports. Uh, to be able to give to the patients. I know pa patients, a lot of the times when they participate in these genetic uh, projects, they wanna know uh, their results. And because we're not a CLIA certified, we're not a clinical lab, uh, you know, our results are, are not, we can't 
uh, put re reports, but we're working with a company that will allow us to do this. And eventually we would like to have this done in Brazil where there will be a Brazilian Parkinson's panel that clinicians can ask for when they see a family, for example, uh, that they will look at those common genes in Brazil, not the common genes in, in you know, Turkey or, or even in Spain, but the ones in Brazil that I will give you a lot of information. And then those families that are negative for that, then we can use to uh, identify new genes. But I think this is gonna be very important. And I think all this data that we're gonna collect in Brazil is gonna allow us to do that and identify those genes and those variants that are specific to the Brazilian uh, people that we can offer very cheap uh, tests that clinicians can apply for uh, to learn more about their patients and and uh, and, uh, and the genetic uh, that these patients have. So yeah, so hopefully I, I think in two or three years we'll be in a really good position to be able to do this. Ok, vou falar em português agora também. Seguir aqui o, o exemplo do Bruno. Então é, a gente dá por encerrada essa palestra. Doutor Inácio, muito obrigada mais uma vez, foi uma honra contar com a sua presença aqui no nosso evento. Doutor Bruno, muito obrigado também por ter intermediado esse encontro, né? E esperamos nos ver novamente. E para quem está nos assistindo, vamos dar continuidade ao nosso programa com a palestra do doutor Divago agora em seguida. E muito obrigada mais uma vez. Um, um prazer e espero poder ver-nos em Belém pronto. <risos> que bom. Tchau. Obrigado, Nath.